four. Darkmyths.org and the Opalist Media Group proudly present to you the Lone Gunman Podcast. Featuring your host, Rob Clark. Where research comes to shine and myths come to die. Stay tuned. Be right there. What is up, everybody? This is your boy, Rob Clark. This is the Lone Gunman Podcast. And this week we are back for part two of the interrogations with Bart Camp. Bart is a highly prestigious researcher affiliated with Dealey Plaza UK, the ROKC Forums, and last year's Lancer, uh, was it Researcher of the Year, I think? Um, or the New I, Frontier? Yeah, I got an award, but um, I'm... I'm shamefully now can't remember what it was for. It was New Frontier Award or New Yeah, something. Yeah, I think like it was a New that. Frontier Award for uh, excellence in research. But anyway, oh, uh, you all know this or he wouldn't be on my damn show. Bart, welcome <laughs> to the show, my friend. How you doing? Thank you for having me, Rob, uh, once again. Um and uh, to everybody else listening, thank you also for listening. Actually, I have to say one thing. Uh, the Prayer Man movie, I just posted it on Facebook, but uh, those people not familiar with the Prayer Man uh, phenomenon, uh, phenomenon is um, I uploaded that film yesterday, exactly two years ago. It's had uh, just under 108,000 views, which roughly wow. comes down to about 1,000 views per week, which I'm quite shocked about. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. You got to ask yourself, like, wh- why do people go to seminars when they basically can just put something like that on the internet and uh, <laughs> it gets listened to as such? Yeah, I mean, you know, I know seminars have got its 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 uh, its benefits as well, of course, through uh, networking uh, as such. But uh, when it comes to uh, an audience and uh, trying to capture that capture that audience with uh, some interesting stuff. You know, the internet is just perfect for that, especially something like YouTube. I've also promised a lot of times that I was going to do a follow-up. I'm trying to work on it. Uh, it's just that uh, when you, when I put that whole thing together two years ago, I spent, uh, I did like three weeks and I wore 80-hour weeks. Uh, it was that much work putting it together and recorded it and so forth. So I'm not really looking forward to doing that again. But uh, therefore, I'm doing it in shorter installments. I'm trying to do 50-minute movies instead. So, for instance, the second floor lunchroom encounter will probably have about four or five segments of 15, 20 minutes each and gradually just uh, make them and release them as such. And it's the same with the interrogations. Um, well, as you know now, the, the interrogations is, is do, being done in two parts. The first part we did and was released three weeks ago and uh, was mainly about the participants of the interrogations, who was there, what did they say, uh, what's available, and so forth. And this second part is about the legal side of it as such, the representation, the people, and also, of course, the people that were involved. Well, that, to me, was, uh, there were quite a few surprises, because I was aware of certain people that were involved in as such, but at the same time, there was also some individuals that I wasn't in aware of Uh, one of them for instance was barefoot sanders i'll get to him later on and um i also was given uh quite a bit of documentation in the last few months uh one of them was uh, malcolm blunt he gave me a few documentation documents that were incredibly interesting and uh were relevant to that essay um for those who don't know the first version of the essay came out early september uh, alongside the third update to the second floor lunchroom encounter, which never happened, but that aside. And um, I am working on an update. I don't know when the update is going to be ready. There's about 30 extra pages in 
it, it's mainly documentation and photographs. It's going to be some extra chapters in it. And um, either I'm going to release it just before Christmas or early in the new year. I don't know. Um, when I yeah, feel and, they, and they can find all that on prayer-man.com. Exactly. Um, when I will release it, you just go to the diary section and uh, you'll see the link uh, to it. It will probably be and posted um, through my website, but the, the Dealey Plaza UK website will uh, mirror it as well. So uh, so there's no problems with regards to uh, uh, downtime out of my site or uh, their site. My site gets hacked quite a lot. There's quite a lot of hacking attempts to bring the site down. Whether that's, uh, I don't know why, but, uh, you know, you can see that it's suspicious or not. I just see it as a nuisance and uh, this is arming myself against that nuisance by uh, mirroring uh, the documents or the important, the important papers, basically, as such. So. Always good to do. So yeah. let's, yeah, yeah, it's just handy and it's just, it, it just needs to be done, uh, in all honesty, especially in this age. Um, it's all what we read about is that people and companies get hacked all the time. So, um, and um, I spend a lot of time, as I said in the last interview, I was in the hospital in the summer for three months, and uh, it was practically the only thing I did was spend time on the, on that on that paper. And uh, it was also the reason why it became 300 pages, so um, it's quite a bit. So uh, let's just talk about um, the legal side of uh, Lee Oswald. There is quite a bit of documentation about that in, in a way. Um, some of it is utter rubbish and some of it is incredibly valuable. Now I leave that to the reader themselves to make up, to picture themselves what's right and what's wrong and um, what uh, what they believe in, what they think is uh, just an administrative oversight or a willful attempt at uh, being deceitful. But um, I think the most important part of it uh, when you're looking at this stuff um when this happened in 1963 is you have to put it in the context of 1963. You know, you don't look at it at, well, through 2017 eyes. You look at it through 1963 eyes. Yeah, and I mean, le- legally, legally, you know, things were a little different back then too, as yeah. far as, I mean, you know, yeah. rights. And... Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Rights, but also like, which I basically brought up in the first episode um, in part one Techniques. is about yeah how they were basically interrogating and this was all done a lot of it was just done by uh, well either word of mouth or uh, just making a brief summation of notes um, which basically weren't even live notes so this is for instance evident with Will Fritz's notes they weren't taken during the interrogation they were written down after the interrogation and in, in the paper itself it also shows that basically like um, it wasn't a man of making notes or recordings as such. But then again, nor was the Secret Service, uh, nor were the FBI. The, you know, the FBI, for instance, wrote things down in a notebook. And if you look at Hosey's notes that are reproduced in the, in the paper, um, it's very incoherent. It's got, uh, you know, the next sentence has got absolutely nothing to do with uh, the sentence before. And... Um, and FBI procedure back then was that the handwritten notes were going to be typed up and they were that typed up affidavit would be or report would be signed and, and, and then those handwritten notes would be destroyed. That was basically the uh, procedure, the process of of, um, of the FBI as such. Dallas police or um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Harry Dean Holmes from the U- USPS. They basically just did everything by memory. So when they were in, like, court, they would just do it from the top of their head, which is unbelievable. You can't even imagine that these days that somebody like a police officer would just say, well, that's what he said to me, and there's absolutely no record present. Or there's a really small scrap of paper with a few notes on it. You just can't imagine that at all, like, in, 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 in 2017. And stuff. Yeah, I mean, well, it, now that's these all days, we, everything that's all we is have today because they did not they did not record it. On the audio. Yeah, I mean, yeah, a lot of people find that suspicious as well, and um, it isn't because um, nobody recorded it. And in hindsight, there was talk about it. Yeah, maybe I should have done it this, that, and the other. Uh, Secret Service said the same thing, 
Um, what I didn't know, and that was only during the investigation, uh, investigating this whole matter, was that for Sorrells, for instance, yeah, I should have wiped myself up when I went in, blah, 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 blah. And he got to talk to Oswald on his own after Fritz had this first go at him. And he basically in, interviewed him in a corner in Fritz's office, not in the, particularly in the room where he was being held. It was just outside in the office itself. And uh, he just spoke to him as such. And he didn't record it at all. And f from the paperwork that is shown, um, that was discovered by Helmer Reinberg, um, there is like half a page of stuff written down, which just got absolutely no bearing about what he was doing at the Texas School Book Depository or whatever, where he was staying at the time, etc. And um, he, um, there is probably a page missing. So, but you know, that's the way it goes. But anyway, so let's go back to the legal rights uh, bits. Now, in that time, Henry Wade was the DA. He was elected as a Dallas DA in 52. And he stayed in that position until 1988. And he's one of the, probably one of the most recognized DAs in, in the States. And he held a really high conviction rate um, that um, no one else in the States could match. Now, this is funny because, in a way, this is, sounds very similar to what Will Fritz did because Will Fritz had a 98% clearance rate as well as a homicide did, um, captain. So uh, they were basically uh, married in, in that respect. Um, Will Fritz has been uh, in a position at the in Dallas uh, as a captain also for many decades. Um, he died in '84, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, he was uh, he left the Dallas police a few years before that. Um, after taking up another position, which he wasn't very happy with, and uh, he left uh, shortly after that. Now, the uh, motto or was that from the Dallas DA, Henry Wade, was that they would used to say conviction at any cost. And that was how it was described uh, as his tenure during, um, during that time. He was a district attorney. Now, there's the Innocence Project that basically came off in... Uh, uh, when was that? 2000, just after the millennium, 2005, 2006. And they basically started to look in that whole tenure of um, the Dallas DA, Henry Wade, and his um, assistant DAs. And they basically managed to overturn quite a few convictions um, that were murder charges and uh, rape or burglary that were won by uh, Wade and his two successors. Uh, and from that, there's about 250 other cases under review. Now, what you've got to know is that in during Wade's tenure, um, he the evidence in general was ignored and defense lawyers were kept in the dark. And um, this is, uh, for instance, the case of Jamie Lee Woodward, who was released in April uh, of... I think a year, a few years ago, after 27 years in prison for a murder, and the DNA showed that he didn't commit it. And Wade's office withheld from defense attorneys with the photographs of tire tracks at the crime scene that didn't match his car, Woodward's car. And basically, they tried to just get these cases done really quickly and get these people just convicted, even if they knew that uh, the people, the person was innocent. They they just did that. Now, I spoke about the, the, the Tommy Lee Woodward case in the first uh, episode as well uh, during Fritz's tenure. Uh, what the whole thing, what Wade did and what, what Fritz did was like a marriage. And it was just in, intertwined as such that they put these people on the chair or for a very long time in, in prison as such. There's a book. There's a good article about this uh, in uh, D Magazine from 77. This is called The Law on Henry Wade. And then later on, there's a, a book that came out um, that um, one of his old uh, assistants basically wrote down. And you've got to know that um, that after the investigation, such the miscarriages of justice uh, in, um, in Texas, and especially Dallas, were 10 times the national average so you know that that whole setting in itself is of course lethal by the time 
you are basically accused of murder. And especially when you're accused of murdering a policeman, which in this case was Tippett. Yeah, that's, now, a, little, um, uh, that's a little high there. <laughs> but... Yeah, exactly. And um, so um, we know, like, for instance, from uh, which is a really good book, is Into the Nightmare by uh, uh, Joseph McBride, which is a really good uh, summation of uh, a lot of evidence and uh, witness statements. And it just shows that the whole thing is just on the shaky ground. I myself um, didn't really involve myself with the Tippett murder then besides the basics but just by looking at the lineup lineups that were held with Oswald in them you already know that there's a lot uh, is, is on shaky ground although the, the, the detective in charge which is Jim Lavelle um, says that he has got a rock solid case as such um, now the thing with Wade is that he um, he basically prosecuted Oswald already in front of the television. You know, he said many times that he had evidence and he didn't want to discuss the evidence. That's another thing that uh, uh, Wolf Fritz repeated as well. And, um, he, you know, as I said as well, he said, how many cases of this type have you been involved in? That is when the death penalty is involved. And Wade said, since I've been district attorney, I've asked for the death penalty in 24 cases. And how many times had he attained it? The reporter continued, and Wade replied in a blonde, stone-faced monotone, 23. And also, he said, like, I've sent people to the electric chair on less. Uh, That's quite an astonishing thing to say if you think about it. Um, um, Wade gave a couple of uh, press conferences, um, one of them uh, where he's basically... uh, He doesn't have a real grasp of the evidence that is actually... uh, involved, for instance, like Oswald's palm print as found on a box in the sniper's nest. But what Wade didn't mention, for instance, was that it was among 23 other fingerprints and 11 palm prints that were unaccounted for. Yeah, so it, in a nutshell, that whole evidence means absolutely nothing. Uh, then, of course, the rifle uh, is discussed, the backyard photos he mentions, the package, uh the list goes on with a lot of so-called evidence that can be disputed one way or another. Well, we know all this from, you know, this has been discussed left, right and center by everybody who's researching this stuff when it comes to the rifle, when it comes to the package and so forth. You know, we know that Buck Buell Frazier is not a very steady witness as it comes to that. The same goes for the backyard photos and so forth. Um, the uh, the book that I just mentioned earlier is basically is called Henry Wade's Tough Justice, and it's uh, it gives you a great insight into the uh, miscarriages of justice under his tenure, and the uh, office of conviction rate and so forth of, of of innocent defendants and so forth. It's um it's very it's a very good book. It's not even thin. If you start reading it, you could read it in uh, within a day. So uh, it's a, it's a very good book actually. I w- I would recommend it. Now, if you think that Wade is hardcore, then you want to look at Bill Alexander. Bill Alexander is even more hardcore. This hardcore right-wing, probably racist, and um, just um, really, well, I'd call him a nasty piece of work, actually. Oh, this is the um, assistant carried, DA? Yes, exactly. And he fought in World War II in North Africa, and he carried a gun. He had a gun on him at all times. And he tried most death penalty cases during the 50s and the 60s. And, uh, you know, OK, just, it, this guy uses rather colorful language. So they're his words and not mine. In Gary Shaw's cover up, for instance, he's asked by Newsman on the, November the 22nd if he could tell anything about suspect Lee Oswald. And Alexander snapped. Yes, he's a goddamn communist. Later that day, he was zealously preparing to charge the prisoner with killing the president as part of an international communist conspiracy. Yeah. And it was with uh, malice forethought. Now, um, Barefoot Sanders, which I'll get to in a minute, he basically had to contact him and say, just shut up and not talk about this again, because, of course, we also know that um, uh, Johnson called up and said, look, you've got your man. Uh, quit messing about about uh, communist conspiracy or conspiracy overall. Um, Oswald did it. And that's that. Um, so, and then in Larry Sneed's, uh, no more silence, um, 
Alexander claims to have been present in the early evening with Rolf Fritz to interrogate Oswald. And um, this is also repeated by others that he was a lot more present. And this is a thing as well that I found that only later on that he was actually present in that room. Um, he slags off a lot of other people that basically claim to have been in that room instead of him. But uh, <clears throat> apparently he has been in that interrogation room as such. Then um, let me just put some more uh, colorful language forward because it's... Uh, in an article in Texas Monthly from 1975, although Alexander, known to members of the press as Old Snake Eyes, was the main reason Henry Wade got all those death penalties that the leaders of Dallas were convinced would deter crime. But he's no longer on the DA staff. Shortly after his infamous declaration that Chief Justice Earl Warren didn't need impeaching, he needed hanging. Um, that basically forced uh, the others to tell... Um, him to resign because uh, you know that remark was uh, a little bit off the hook unhinged wow, basically yeah. and, and um, he was also getting hostile to uh, to to a lot of people uh, like especially the east coast uh, yanks basically he'd say I'd like to kick the dog shit out of every yankee newspaper man club the fuckers to the ground he said you can still see them right up to this day hanging around the book depository Alexander went on Fat ass Yankees in shorts and cameras getting the roofs of their mouths sunburned. <laughs> he also called basically Fritz one of the intellectually honest officers he'd ever met. And that's quite a statement as well. Um, there's, there's, there's quite a bit more. I'm not going to divulge everything from the paper. Um, there are uh, quite a few. Uh, I, I added an interview. Uh, which is very colorful. And, um, yeah, I'm still going to do some more research on him. But uh, that guy should have never been in a position uh, of uh, of that kind of authority as uh, as he was basically being able to send people to the electric chair as such. I'm going to delve more into the whole justice system as it was. Um, there's There are bits. If someone has anything, I'd love to hear it um about this stuff i read every day I, I get snippets here and there but uh i just uh i find it really interesting how uh, texas justice was uh, applied in those yeah, days yeah and i think he was and, you a, know you still <clears throat> had, i think he was running around yeah, bart with some of the cops that day when they were looking for oswald after that's the true. assassination he was with his, uh, the uh, the tippet murder he was in the car and he went straight down to the scene and apparently it was at the t near the texas theater as well if i'm not mistaken i yep. could be wrong but i know for yeah. a fact that he was at the tippet murder scene yep so that's the same guy we're talking about here folks yeah yeah this is a this guy is really hardcore hardcore right wing now then you've got um barefoot sanders now barefoot sanders was basically the district attorney for uh the district, sorry, the United States attorney for 100 counties in North Texas. And what's, um, for those that don't know, um, he was basically Martha Jo Stroud's boss. Now, Martha Jo Stroud became a really known entity in Barry Ernest's book with the Martha Jo Stroud document. That document basically said that she saw Baker and Truly come up the stairs after Victoria Adams and Sandra Stiles had gone down the stairs. That document was suppressed. And through a miracle, that document basically surfaced while Barry Ernest was searching at the uh, National Archives as such. This was in 1999. So this was suppressed for more than 30, 36 years. Now, Barefoot Sanders was her boss. And um, there are, um, uh, I was given an interview uh, of Barefoot Sanders with William Manchester, who wrote Death of the President. But um, these are like rough notes. And uh, I've got to thank Malcolm Blunt for that. And um, what you can see in those notes is that they had huge trouble trying to uh, know, find something that they could charge Oswald with because, believe it or not, what a lot of people know as well is that killing a president, right, wasn't really something they could charge you could charge someone with, which is quite an astonishing thing, especially after the fact that when you think about it, what Lincoln, when was Lincoln shot? 100 years, 80 years before that, I don't know the exact date, but it was in the century before. That somebody 65, I think. Well, there you go. 
but that's almost 100 years before. So even yeah. in, uh, 100 years after, there was no statute that basically said, like, well, killing off a president is an illegal thing. So what they then tried to do is basically say, like, well, uh, we could try a general conspiracy statute or trying to overthrow the government or um, Treason. The, the violation of the United States code. And these are all like bits that, well, that was what they tried to come up with. And this is also um, makes things clearer with the fact that he wasn't charged with the murder of the president. You see, a lot of people say that, no, he was charged. No, he wasn't charged. I said that in the first episode. He was never arraigned for the murder of the president. He was only arraigned for the murder on Tippett. And again, I'll bring you back to the bit that uh, Fritz talked to Lavelle and asked him whether he had a case on him regarding sh killing the cop, J.D. Tippett. And Lavelle said, yeah, I've got three or four witnesses. It's cut and dry. We can take him for that one. And to court for that one. And um, the, um, this just shows that um, with you, when you add all these bits together, the Fritz thing and the... Uh, the fact that he wasn't arraigned, and Fritz and Lavelle, the, thing, the fact that he wasn't arraigned, and then this bit on Barefoot Sanders that they had no clue what to charge him with. You know, that all comes together, and you just start to look, and you go, this, this shows why he wasn't actually charged as such. Um, Sanders himself um, called it a state problem. And um, Well, hang, hang on a second, Bart. Let me, let me clarify something for the listeners. And myself here. Yeah. <clears throat> so at the midnight press conference, you know, when he, they got Oswald up there and they asked him if he if he'd been charged with killing the president, and somebody said you have been charged, mm -hmm. and he acted like he didn't know what they were talking about. What I mean, exactly? Were, were they wrong at that point, or no? Well, basically, what the police they just said they were making up the paperwork just before that press conference so they in the corridor they just said like yeah we're going to charge him with the president as such blah 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 but they never did that you see they just lied and again trial by media so they just sat through the through the corridors with the whispers chinese whispers and just said like we're charging him with the murder of the president and so forth right so he was never then is formally the charged exactly exactly gotcha. so then the press conference then the press conference and then he basically uh, says he doesn't know anything about it, and then it basically being told, like, yeah, you have been charged. And when you see the video, look at the grimace on his face, like, oh, I'm fucked, yeah, like that. And basically, then after that, he was supposed to be arraigned, and that's what they said they did, but he didn't. They returned him to his cell. The only thing that basically was done with Oswald at that night is that the evidence was taken by the FBI towards Washington. And part of that evidence was a shirt. Now, for the listeners, if you're looking at videos of Oswald in the corridors, which I'll get back to, to in a mo, is that um, when you look at that, you see him either in his shirt uh, with his T-shirt underneath, and those recordings are from the 22nd. When you see him in his white T-shirt, and there's only two or three recordings of that, one is really short, blink, and you'll miss him. But one of them, which a lot of people will probably recognize is the one where he says, I emphatically deny these charges. And he's basically being pulled around, pushed uh, through the corridors as such, and being locked up as such. I'll get to that in a minute. But the ones with the white T-shirt are the ones from the 23rd. So it's really easy to distinguish them as uh, between them. Now, yeah, you, can, with, you can tell like he was I said, pissed off. <laughs> oh, of course. You know, he was being, basically being told that he was going to be... Uh, executed as such, and God knows what they go through. Now, I um, want to talk about those movies, actually, um, which are quite important. And then I've, there's a chapter that I call The Corridor Confrontations in the Press Conference. Now, the first one that basically knew about something is Frank Underwood. He filmed Oswald in the elevator of the DPD station while they went up in the elevator. And in uh, Richard Trask's book, Pictures of the Pain, he says, I reached the hall in time to film Oswald being brought in, and I rolled up in the elevator with him. A police sergeant said, we got witnesses that saw him shoot Tippett. The police tell us whether or not the suspect is good for the charges, and we know how to play the story. But Oswald leaned around and looked straight at me, saying defensively, 
I didn't kill anybody. Now, there's a video of Oswald arriving, where it's even uh, into um, Fritz's office, where, um, where he has his shirt hanging off his back, like only on his left shoulder, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Billy Lovelady is sitting there, and he's just looking at him while he passes by as such. Um, the uh, videos, I'll uh, send you a few links so you can place them under uh, your uh, under the uh, article, uh, under the interview. And uh, they're basically asking, like, whether he killed him. I didn't shoot anybody. Uh, do you have a lawyer? No, I don't, and so forth. And there's quite a few um, videos of that. There's also videos without sound. I don't know why, but there, there are shots of him where he's basically escorted through the corridors. Now, this is a, one of the biggest things that you've got to pay attention to, is the fact that on the 22nd, the world press was there. I mean, of course, the locals were there in the afternoon when he was arrested, and uh, correspondents as such, international correspondents as such. But, of course, during the, that day, people flew in from wherever to, to capture what was happening. Now, everyone was allowed in that corridor. You know that. You can see that. There's, there's up to like 100 or maybe 200 people standing in that corridor filming away with huge cameras and so forth and microphones and photographers, of course. And you can see the difference. On the first day, you see in the footage that he was just escorted, but he was talking all the time. He said all the time, I don't have a lawyer. I didn't shoot anyone and so forth. And that changes on the 23rd because then... He's basically being rushed through the corridor much faster, much more police are surrounding him, trying to prevent him from talking and so forth. That's a massive difference because the cops, of course, have learned that he talks too much because he keeps saying, I don't have a lawyer. I'm looking for legal representation and so forth. And this is now the, the, the main bit is the fact that is that Oswald, during the press conference, also, of course, asked for legal representation. If I'm not mistaken, three times, I think he did. He asked for someone to come forward. Someone to come forward. That's an important sentence as well. In the actual uh, statements from Fritz and all the others, they keep talking about John Apt. The name John Apt comes out in statements from them, but those statements are made after Oswald's been killed. The name John App doesn't come forward until a man called H. Lewis Nichols, who's for the Dallas Bar Association, I think he's the president, does an interview in the corridor. Now, he sees Oswald on the 23rd around, I'd say, between 5 and 6 p.m. And then he basically is being asked by Jesse Curry, Dallas Police Chief Jesse Curry, to do an interview in the corridor. I'll also put the link towards that. In that bit, the name John Abt finally comes out as such. You see, when the Dallas police starts writing all these reports, they make it sound it's on the day itself, like on the 22nd. But it's rubbish. Utter rubbish. It doesn't exist. Because, first of all, the press conference, it shows he asked for someone to come forward. You know, whereas they made it sound like, no, he wants John Abt because he's a famous communist, defend, uh, communist defender. And two is the fact that... Uh, uh, hold on, let me just think, because I just lost my train of thought here for a second. Is that the fact that they basically wrote these reports much later, afterwards, and they made it sound as such. Oswald asked for someone to come forward, or, and according to the police, secondly says, if I can't get apt, I'll ask for the ACL, ACLU. The Civil Liberties Oh yeah. Now, in Dallas, there is the DCLU, which is uh, a division of the ACLU as such. Now, the guy that is involved with that whole thing, the DCLU, is a man, a man by the name Greg Olds. Greg Olds is still alive. I think Greg Parker talked to him. But when the uh, questions became a little bit too sharp, the... Uh, did a runner, <laughs> and uh, I would I wouldn't mind talking to him. I might give him a call uh, someday. And uh, I've managed to get a hold of uh, um, a lot of files and uh, a lot of uh, correspondence by Olds. And basically, Olds, <clears throat> excuse me, gets a call in the during the day on the twenty second. Now 
who from isn't really clear. This is the problem. And um, they go very late in the evening. They go, uh, they go to the Dallas police. Now, one of them is Olds himself and another guy called Greer Raggio. Um, well, talk in a fair amount of detail about him. But they're going late in the evening. And we're talking like 11 o'clock. Now, first they go and try to get hold of um, Bill Cabell, the mayor of Dallas. And uh, they have no success with that. And then they meet with the professor, a professor named Charles Webster. Now, Webster himself was a lawyer. But, oh, he was there practically most of the day. So it's a bit of a question. Why didn't he offer any help regarding legal representation for Lily Oswald? Nobody knows. It's an enigma. But Olds and Raggio, they meet Charles Webster and they meet him outside the office of Captain Fritz. Fritz takes them to see Captain King. Now, apparently there's four guys within the Olds group. I so far have only managed to identify Olds and Radio. I don't know who the two other guys are. So if I do get to talk to him on the phone, that's one of my main questions to find out who, besides also who called him as such. Now, they meet Wade as well. About 10 minutes prior, the midnight press conference of Oswald as such. And the problem is this. Olds thinks like the whole thing is taken care of because that's what Captain King and Wade say. He doesn't want to be represented by anyone. And this is in direct contradiction of Oswald in the corridor saying, I haven't been seen by anyone. Now, the problem, I'm represented by anyone and I would like somebody to represent me. Um, here's the funny bit. Olds goes to the, Olds is satisfied with all that, what Wade and Captain King tell him, Glenn King. And then he goes to the press conference. And this is the funny bit, because at that press conference, he says it three times that he would like to be represented as such. And Oates doesn't do anything about that. That's really odd. I don't know why. Um, maybe he got his facts wrong. But um, when he said that he basically uh, thought it was all right before the press conference, because he spoke to Wade as well, that he didn't want representation. And then sees Oswald during the press conference where he says that three times that he wants to be represented by someone. That's a bit odd. The other thing is that if you want to be represented by the ACLU, you need to be a member. Now, Oswald, together with Mike Payne, went to a meeting of the ACLU and he became a member. He sent him a check for $2. And at first, the ACLU totally denies it. And after a week or 10 days, they finally find um, his membership and his check as such. Which is also, what a strange coincidence once again. First it's gone, then it just appears, oh, uh, well, he's dead anyway, so don't worry about it as such. Now, Ultra's was down the 22nd, and then it goes down to the 23rd, and that's when H. Lewis Nichols comes in. And as I said, he didn't show up until late in the afternoon. He was the president of the Dallas Bar Association. And he was no criminal lawyer. And if you see the video, he's like, well, I'm a criminal lawyer. Well, of course, you know a lot if you are the president of the Dallas Bar Association. And on top of that, he basically feigns disinterest. When you read the Warren Commission testimony, when you read... Uh, when you see the video, and there's also a video of him uh, that was taken about, I think, about 10 years ago. I put the link into the paper as well. And it just shows like, well, you know, I'm not really interested as such. Really odd. Again, um, definitely a person to look into. And especially I um, urge you to watch the video where he talks to the press in the corridor. And he's got Jesse Curry standing next to him. And at some point, you see Jesse Curry moving away from it as well. So it's like, oh, well, you know what? He's got, he's done his job. He's talked, he, he's mentioning what, what I want to know as such. And he basically uh, slides, slides out of there, away from the whole thing. 
Um, then there's, of course, the, uh, the matter about the uh, phone calls and who he, he, who he called. You've got, of course, um, Grover Proctor's work. I didn't add it into the first uh, version. It's going to be added in the second. I don't know what to think of it. Um, it could well be true. At the same time, it could be a total fugazi. Um, it's a uh, compartmentalized issue. And uh, not many can back up what's happening. We don't know the officers who were in there, who disconnected the call. Uh, besides the two ladies that uh, took that um, that um, uh, the telephone operators as such, um, it's a bit of a strange one. I, I, I want to believe it, but at the same time, it's, it's one of those things where uh, there's no backup uh, in any shape or form that puts this down as... Uh, as, as something that really actually happened. Um, there's the slip as such, uh, the telephone slip. And um, I just, uh, yeah, you know, it's a photocopy and it's been smudged and so forth. So uh, again, um, I wish I could see a clearer copy as such. So um, now that brings us to um, also the phone calls he made. One of them we know for a fact is towards Ruth Payne. And he called, uh, he rang her at 3.30 or 4 o'clock on uh, Saturday afternoon on the 23rd. And uh, even that as well, uh, Mrs. Payne was not interested in helping Oswald at all. I think she had a serious dislike for him. Um, whether that is because of jealousy or the fact that uh, he didn't treat uh, Marina correctly, I don't know. Uh, but uh, it just shows that uh, Mrs. Payne uh, didn't have a lot of uh, interest in helping him at all, didn't bother. And um, I have took uh, chopped out some of the evidence, the uh, statements that she gave for the Warren Commission to uh, Albert Jenner. And uh, just make up your mind yourself when you read it. And you just see that uh, she didn't give a toss. Now, John J. Apps. John J. Apps was basically um, a lawyer who was defending communists and of course uh, I bet he had a busy job in, uh, in those days and especially after uh, the McCarthyism uh, just finished and uh, you know uh, a lot can be said about John Apt but I've tried to figure out basically what happened in that weekend you see here's another thing you have to think about if Oswald had requested his legal rights and wanted to talk to Apt as they said on um, Friday then they could have gotten hold of Apt in his office because Apt didn't leave for his holiday home until Friday evening. And that's when the press started to get hold of him, they say, on a Saturday morning. And, of course, they couldn't get hold of him. But then they found out where he was living, where he was hanging out in his, in his holiday place. And uh, <clears throat> they got hold of him. And he, of course, feigned, uh, you know, didn't have any, any idea what they were talking about as such. Because nobody bothered to call him from the Dallas police as such, or even Oswald himself. You see, Oswald didn't get any phone calls whatsoever. And um, the reason why they said he didn't get any phone calls was, according to Rolf Fritz, he goes, well, we were a little bit busy with the lineups and the fingerprints and so forth. You know, they didn't give him his phone call until the next day. All right. That brings us um, apt to himself gets interviewed uh, for his Warren Commission testimony. It's one of the shortest uh, testimonies uh, being given. And then um, what we're going else going to mention here is um, I'll cut it here, Rob, for a second. I need to collect my thoughts, make a note. So these are all like the main characters that are involved around Oswald and his legal rights as such. But also what a lot of people have to know is that there were people that did offer their legal assistance to Oswald. And one of these people is Harold McDervid. He was a lawyer from Chicago. And he sent a telegram on the 23rd. And that's after trying through the phone to get in touch with the Dallas Police Department. That telegram has never been delivered to Oswald as such. It was kept quiet. I showed evidence 
it's all there and it basically shows that 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 telegram and the services of McDermott are basically never offered to Oswald as such. On top of that, McDermott himself gets investigated big time by the FBI. Again, I enclose all the documents in that in that essay as such. Now, there's a great article um, uh, that I've po po posted in there as well, which is from the St. Louis Dispatch of November the 24th. And it's without a shadow of a doubt, one of the most important articles to come out shortly after the assassination. And they ask important questions. And they did that also right after the assassination in light of the Dallas Police Department's handling of the case regarding Oswald's departure from the Texas School Book Depository. They're very tenacious and diligent in their investigation as such. It's unbelievable that, you know, that no one else actually did this like this newspaper did. It's the St. Louis Dispatch. And it mentions everything. It mentions the ACLU. It mentions John J. Abb. It mentions H. Lewis Nichols. But it also brings Percy Foreman forward. And that's a name that was not to be repeated by many other newspapers. And he's quoted from the article. And I'll, I'll just do this. Authorities are running a serious risk of jeopardizing their case against Oswald by failing to observe his constitutional rights. Offic officials may already have committed a reversible error in the case by permitting the accused to undergo more than 24 hours of detention without benefit of legal counsel. As grounds for reversal, Foreman stated, under recent decisions of the United States Supreme Court, federal pr procedural guarantees must be observed even in state prosecutions. Their abridgment, he said, can be grounds for reversal of even a conviction. This is a new law. They could get a conviction in Texas and get it thrown out on appeal. But it takes a long time for these law enforcement officers to realize it. Now, that by itself is quite a serious statement. Yeah. Now, Foreman, Foreman himself was a criminal defense attorney from Houston. And he ended up defending Jack Ruby, but be it only for a few days only, because he got dismissed by Ruby's family. And um, General Walker and also James O. Ray, uh, Martin Luther King's alleged assassin, who felt that he was being railroaded by him and dismissed him as well. So in a way, he comes up with a really serious statement. But if we're looking in real life, what he did, he got dismissed from all these other cases and such rather quickly. It was only like a few days. Um, I find it just interesting that there's observations that it would be very hard for Oswald to get a fair trial and that it was under detention for more than 24 hours without the assistance of legal counsel. And he is entitled to counsel, whether he requests it or not. Um, that's quite an important bit. And this is why they basically started messing around with their statements afterwards. You know, this is, when you read something like that, the lawmen and the lawyers that are in that building, yeah, the DAs and so forth, they're aware of that. And that's why they say he didn't want legal assistance. Yet that's in the statements. Yet we know from the videos that we see Oswald in during the press conference, in the corridor himself, basically stating as such that he wants someone to come forward and help him out. Um, you know, it's, it's a really dirty game being played here. And if you just look at the bigger picture, you look at Wade's record, you look at Fritz's record, I mean, 98%. What a lot of rubbish. You know. Um, yeah, I mean, that's I'm like so incentive for... Oswald to die relatively quickly <laughs> if they yeah. you know, they were informed that hey you guys done screwed this up from the get go you know there's no way he's, you're, you're going to get a conviction now and even if you do it'll get thrown out and you're going to look like idiots and some people might say that basically the Dallas Police Department forced Ruby to kill Oswald I don't know there's no evidence yeah. for that and uh, I doubt there will ever be evidence as such but of course some Consp conspiracy theorists will uh, put that forward as such. Just an um, interesting idea, you know, to throw out there. <laughs> yeah, but it's just, I mean, um, we know we know Ruby was hanging around there. We know he was talking to cops, and we know he was good friends, or at least he thought he was, with a bunch of them. So, well, he got the gun from Joe Cody, who sold it to him uh, right. in a year or two years before that. I mean, he got uh, down the basement yeah. somehow. So, yeah, I mean. You know, he had free access. This whole story about how did he get in the basement? Was he let in? 
I think he could just walk in any time he wanted to. That's the thing. And that's the thing they wanted to cover up, the fact that he was basically so chummy with so many police. I mean, you read the whole thing in the Warren report. It just basically they do their best not to uh, not to go deep into Jack Ruby and his and his affiliations with the Dallas police as such. And the whole thing is also again they lie about it. Like, yeah, we knew him. He came around and brought some donuts. And sometimes we kept on checking in in his uh, in his parlor, uh, his, his his strip club, and so forth. Whereas uh, you know, other people have clearly said like, my God, it was filled to the brim with cops in there. So. You know, and if he had any trouble, then uh, they took care of it there for him. Exactly. You know, they were chummy. The whole, the whole lot. You know, whether it's mob or not, they just these people, these criminals that lived there. They knew the police, and they just basically, you know, were pals practically. Yeah, I mean, you I think know, if as anybody long as you could, could have convinced Jack Ruby to do that, they're one of the top suspects. You know, the the yeah. the, the DPD for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and also uh, when you read uh, Seth Cantor's book, what are the what are the two two investigators called uh, Hubert and Griffin? Well, they were discouraged from investigating Ruby further, and on top of that, they weren't coming along to the interview that they had with Ruby in Dallas as such. Whereas they were the main guys who were investigating Ruby and the killing of Oswald as such. And they were basically left home in Washington. They were not allowed to come along as such. You know, this is really fishy. So, but, you know, it's the way it goes. There's not much you can do about it. So that's pretty much it. I know it's a bit shorter than normal. Um, there's a lot more to read because the actual paper contains a lot of documentation, especially on Greg Old. So I think I've got about 20 odd pages uh, on him. There's uh, there's just loads on 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 what they did and uh, you know there's all type reports of all kinds um, from him and uh, there's some really good newspaper uh, articles as well. Um, and to read the entire you know, paper, just, we're going to point people over to where prayer dash man dot com. I'll well the link is already uh, in uh, underneath the first uh, episode that we did, but um, I will uh, I'll give it again. And you can post it underneath. It's the uh, the the paper is at prayerman prayer man dot com, but also at dd plaza uk dot org. Okay, dd plaza uk dot uk. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I'll uh, I'll send you the links, and you can play it. Uh, plus the videos as well, because there's quite a few videos uh, of Oswald in those corridors as such. Okay. Yeah. It's so uh, it's in the, the end, notes. It's unique. Yeah, it's it's unique uh, if you think about it. Where that uh, the uh, the press was actually just invited to sit on practically to sit on the couch with the D- Dallas Police Department and just listen in and what was happening there as such. Of yes, course, for a reason. Uh, a part, of course, to show that he wasn't being mistreated. And let's face it, uh, Dallas Police had a record uh, of mistreatment of uh, of its uh, arrested. Uh, criminals and yeah. uh of course that um and of course the world press was there so they want to just you know record everything and um you know show that oswald wasn't being mistreated although he did get uh, hit uh, in the uh in the texas theater again that's another question i've read something about the other day was that uh if oswald uh what was it about it was about the gun well, they say about Nick McDonald. Uh, Nick McDonald put his the, the wedge between his uh, forefinger and his uh, index finger and the thumb that came between the hammer and the uh, the bit the, the bullet is yeah right. But at the se- you know that that's the most famous story that a he hit him and then he tried to get his gun out and uh, he basically put and then McDonald put his hand in between the hammer and the and the gun itself so he couldn't fire. Yet at the same time, the same shell showed a, a dent in. That basically was a misfire. So what is it? Did he put his hand in between, or was it an actual misfire as such? You know these things. It's just clear at all. Uh, McDonald was a liar as well, but that's a whole different story. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's pretty much it actually. Uh, I, I, I would say wait for the next update, which comes out either if I feel like it just before Christmas, or otherwise just uh, early in the new year, and. Um, 
then I'm going to continue with my uh, third essay um, paper. It's going to be about the Texas School Book Depository itself. We're talking yeah. about uh, Joe Molina, uh, who's still alive, by the way, but he doesn't want to talk about it. We know that, uh, what's his name? A black guy. I was at uh, the Jude Fair Baker thing uh, a year ago uh, with Larry Rivera. I um, forgot his name. Boy, Edward Lewis. And uh, he's still alive. And um, th so we're going to talk about the blacks. We're talking about Eddie Piper. We're talking about Carl Jones. We're talking Roy Lewis. We're talking Bonnie Ray Williams. Uh, those guys. And again, also in the context of uh, what their testimony actually says and how it actually is being changed by the Secret Service in the first week of December. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing how, uh, <laughs> how that testimony is just being changed around, um, especially the three boys on the fifth floor. Jarman, uh, Williams, and uh, Norman, they uh, they have uh, conflicting stories to tell. And um, then, of course, the women on the fourth floor, Victoria Adams and uh, Sandra Stiles, who made their descent to the back stairs as such, and uh, who, who got a, whose witness testimony was just uh, twisted around and uh, basically said, we don't believe you, you're wrong, this, that, and the other. And Sandra Stiles didn't even get interviewed as such. So that's quite interesting what happened itself uh, in the Texas School Book Depository. I just only, the only thing I've done so far is I wrote about maybe two pages, but I put all the documentations and the pictures I have, and it already comes to 150 pages. So wow. it's going to be, uh, yeah, yeah, it's probably, so if I add all the talk and all the other bits to it, then we'll talk on maybe 250, something like that. So uh, I think in the end, uh, if I have all four stories and put it together and uh, bind them together as in a book, uh, probably hitting somewhere between eight, 800 or 1,000 pages in total. And, of course, the last chapter is, of course, it's going to be on prayer, man. So we've got a few leads on things, um, but it just takes a long time. You know, work and uh, my re recovery from uh, the hospital is still going on this for at least another month, possibly two. Yeah. And then hopefully I hope to go to the States uh, next year and uh, interview a few people and on top of that uh, uh, work uh, work on obtaining the films as such as well and get uh, good digital scans of them um, there are several uh, leads and sources where I can go to as such so it just depends on uh, where I can get the best copy as such and uh, that'll be it for me from a, for, uh, for some time uh, after all four stories are out so then uh, I'll give it all a break as you know, uh, ROKC, um, Greg Parker is going to quit or he's going to hand over the forum and he's going to go more in the background as such. He's just done these four interviews with Alan Dale and uh, basically uh, divulged the information that he's got as such. And um, uh, the some of the other guys, uh, they're, they've hit retirement. So uh, like Terry Martin and uh, Stan Dane has also done what he wanted to do. By bringing out all these short movies on uh, about the second floor lunchroom account on YouTube, which are quite good actually, I enjoyed watching them. And he's also done things on Prayer Man. Um, he's also going to take a step back. So uh, there's going to be few of us uh, basically uh, at ROKC uh, running things and putting things forward as such. But it will probably be uh, Ed Ledoux and I that are trying to push uh, things forward. I would really like to see some uh, fresh meat, uh, especially young ones, come in and uh, try to push the envelope out a little bit more because that's what our KC stands for. We're, uh, we're pushing the envelope. Uh, of course, a lot of people don't like that, especially at other forums. They, uh, we ridicule them as well for it, uh, for that dinosaur mentality as such. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, they are. they the keep them dinosaurs, so. Where yeah. can, uh, where can uh, folks find the ROKC forum if they're interested in, in joining you guys up? Yes. Well, the forum itself is at, if I, I just want to make sure I say this right, reopen Kennedy case, that's one word, dot forum notion dot net. So that's reopen Kennedy case dot forum notion dot net. We have a lot of lurkers there, and uh, that's, that's not a bad thing. We implore people to come and look, and as soon as they have the confidence to join, please do so. Please do join the conversation we get also people that are uh, uh, children or grandchildren of uh, particular people that we've uh, put an investigation uh, that we're investigating 
Uh, that itself is, is quite cool. And, uh, you know, it's not always very helpful. Uh, sometimes there's some really useful information and such. It's kind of cool that they, because they, of course, um, find out that their dad was involved. Uh, William Westbrook, for instance, uh, his son or his, his grandson came to the forum a while back. And there's a few other people that just show up and just basically uh, say, well, he or she was my dad, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's kind of cool uh, because, of course, they do an Internet search and find out. And then, they like, you know, because of the hits that the forum gets, we got a fair amount of hits and uh, they come around and stuff. So, yeah, it's cool. So, Right on. Well, yeah. So if you're interested in, you know, some of the best research being done out there, check out the Reopen Kennedy Case forums at reopenkennedycase.formotion.net. And uh, like I said, you can find Bart online at prayer-man.com for all that stuff. And, yeah. I, and I'll link a bunch of stuff yeah. up in the show notes that we talked about today. Bart, yeah. always a pleasure, forum. my friend. Huh? Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And, and look, you're always welcome back anytime. After you get part three done, we can do it again. Um, uh, I know you. it'll probably be a That'll little be while. It'll be a while, though. Yeah, yeah, it'll be a little be while. Summer next year, probably, or spring next year, because I intend to start it on the new year, in the new year after I've released those uh, two updates, because the second floor lunch room encounter has got a small update as well. Again, a few bits of documentation as such. We finally got hold of. Uh, I've got to say this: we finally got hold of Roy Truly's deleted testimony. We had a lot of trouble about this testimony to get yeah. it. And um, I spoke to this about in one of the previous shows. And all of a sudden, Dennis Moore said basically paid 110 bucks. And guess what that so called deleted testimony entailed? Oh, no. It was somebody reciting Roy Truly's actual testimony at double the speed. So he's just reading it. Blah, 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 period. Blah, 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 period. Blah, 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 period. What the so, hell? I I don't know what the point of that exercise was, and also apparently that is the only uh, bit that was recorded as such of one of the witnesses. I just don't know why. I don't huh. understand why. And there is nothing deleted, and it contains about eighty percent of Truly's actual testimony. When we could try to get it last year, they wanted to charge us ninety dollars. We paid ninety dollars, and after a month, the money was sent back. And now Dennis Moore said basically paid 110 bucks, and he feels like, of course, you know, taken in by it, and says like, you know, <laughs> yeah. and he said to me, he says, I, I wish my money you back got too. it. Yeah, no, he said, he said like, I wish you got it last year because then I wouldn't have to spend 110 bucks on it. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah. It, so and you'd be pissed. Yeah, definitely. So, well, ho- ho- hopefully you got, hopefully you get uh, what 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 you were telling me about and. Uh, Maybe maybe yeah. we can get you back on and talk about that when you do. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, we we'll leave that as a little subject. mystery for the listeners. Yeah, exactly. We leave them uh, leave them guessing. But yeah, if that comes off, hopefully in a few weeks' time, and we've got something, uh, and I'll uh, combine it with uh, the other information uh, we've got, then uh, yeah, that would be a good idea. Yeah. Cool deal. Well, Bart, thank you so much for coming on and doing this again. And I hope to Thank talk you to you in the near future. And look, happy holidays, happy new year, all that good stuff. But I'll Thank see you, you on Facebook, you, too. you know. Oh, of course. Yeah. All right. All right, folks. Thanks that's it. Much. Yep. Thank you, Bart. The son bitch is in the can, yes. beamed up the satellite down directly to your ears, people. This is your boy. Peace. Clear?